day, and welcome to this podcast, the third in the series about a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service. I'm Jeff St. John, the moderator of this series. The series is sponsored by the Policy Insights Forum, a nonpartisan unit of the Samuel Group of Companies. Today, we'll hear from an intelligence and security specialist who will argue that, yes, Canada should have a foreign intelligence service. And so we're privileged to be joined today by Professor Christian Luprecht of the Royal Military College of Canada. He is the editor-in-chief of the Canadian Military Journal, and he is the director of the Institute of Intergovernmental Relations in the School of Policy Studies at Queen's University. He has taught at Yale University in the United States and has been a fellow at NATO Defense College. And he has held a chair at Johns Hopkins University. He is the chair of the Ontario Research Fund Advisory Board. And Professor Luprecht serves with the World Customs Organization, the UK's Polar Institute, and the One Society Network. He is a member of the editorial boards of the journals Armed Forces and Society and Commonwealth and Comparative Politics. He has authored numerous books, including Dirty Money, Financial Crime in Canada, The Canada-United States Open Border Paradox, and Polar Cousins, Comparing Antarctic and Arctic Geostrategic Futures. Of particular relevance to our discussion today, he has co-authored the book Intelligence as Democratic Statecraft, in which he looks at the structures and mechanisms for the accountability of security and intelligence agencies in the Five Eyes countries. Professor Luprecht holds a PhD from Queen's University. Professor, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to talk about why Canada should have a foreign intelligence service similar to the secret intelligence service of Britain, popularly known as MI6. My pleasure. Thanks for your, letting me join the conversation. Let's dive right into it. Almost exactly three years ago, you and a colleague penned an opinion piece in the Globe and Mail that Canada should have its own foreign intelligence service. What, in your view, are the principal reasons that merit the establishment of such a service? Yeah, so let's start with the fact that, of course, Canada does have foreign collection capabilities. So it's not entirely correct that Canada doesn't have a foreign intelligence service. Uh, Canada has a foreign signals intelligence service. Uh, of course, the communication security establishment of long-stand, longstanding reputation and uh, a key contributor to the Five Eyes Intelligence Alliance. Canada has open source collection mechanisms, in particular, of course, uh, through uh, departments of foreign affairs. Many people don't realize that one of the key reasons that we maintain uh, uh, foreign affairs ministries uh, by countries around the world is precisely to have open source ability to engage and to understand networks. So, So just to kind of narrow down the question, the question is really, should Canada have a foreign collection agency or entity? And likely, should Canada have a foreign human collection entity in some capacity? So this is just to dispel sort of some of the myths that are out there that Canada has no visibility on uh, on 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 the world in terms of foreign uh, foreign collection. And a very important point, which, as you know, many people do not realize. So the the other way to go about this is that, you know, most Canadians, you know, we have a fairly homeopathic national security posture in this country. One of the elements that makes this country so prosperous is precisely that. Um, we don't invest a lot in defense, security, intelligence, which is money that, of course, is available to governments to spend on other things, social well-being and so forth. So it's always a bit of a hard sell in this country to convince Canadians that uh, the world is changing and that these are ultimately investments that are worth it. I always think of this as sort of an insurance premium to pay how dangerous do you think the world is and what sort of premium are we prepared to pay? You know, how likely do you think your house is to burn down? Well, you know, it's uh, it, it, it looks like the firestorms are uh, are growing a little bit bigger and growing a little bit closer. And so perhaps it might be good to pay a higher premium. And of course, our key allies all pay that premium. So this is where Canada stands out. If you look at the G7 countries, Canada is the only member of the G7 that currently does not have a separate dedicated foreign collection or hum, foreign human intelligence collection service uh, 
um, as a standalone uh, as a standalone entity. Are there any other arguments that you would make in favor of a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service? For example, so, would would we perhaps have more access to Allied human intelligence reporting? So let's understand what a uh, what these foreign intelligence services sort of broadly conceived do. They te- generally tend to have two broad tasks. One is um, a relatively passive task, which tends to be collection on political, economic, social sort of dynamics, aspects, people, networks, and so forth uh, in countries. Uh, and the other tends to be an active uh, task in terms of influencing those countries uh, to perhaps the extremes of assassinations, re- regime change, and the like. Canada is unlikely to be engaged in the latter and is likely going to always leave that to its 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 bigger allies. But there is something to be said about whether Canada needs a more comprehensive system in terms of the intelligence that it is able to gather on uh, countries that are competitors and in particular on countries that are adversaries, especially in a world where geostrategic competition is on the rise, as is the aggressiveness by our by our adversaries, including uh, significant counter-normative uh, acts that run counter to the uh, generally perceived liberal um, international a political order, as we've known it in recent decades, um, from which Canada has benefited disproportionately. So in order to preserve that order, we might do well to invest in uh, in preserving it and understanding the challenges uh, that exist to that order, not just to Canada directly, but for instance, the challenges that exist to the institutions that Canada uses as force multipliers, uh, whether you think of NATO, you think of the various sort of UN sort of system uh, entities, and you think of sort of broader structures that promote the sort of values that we believe are important in order to provide security, prosperity, and democracy. So the political, economic, social, human values that uh, that ultimately go along with that. And so... On that end, you might say that Canada sort of has very good tactical capabilities. We've mentioned, for instance, CSE. We've mentioned the domestic capabilities that the Canadian Security Intelligence Service has with some capacity internationally. Um, we have global affairs, but we saw we we see some of the limits of those. Uh, we know that uh, global affairs, for instance, uh, has recently run into trouble when it got into uh, collection mechanisms that uh, are not necessarily uh, standard sort of open source collection and strays into uh, perhaps more more covert type of operations where you don't entirely disclose perhaps the entire purpose of uh, what you're up to. We've seen CSIS increasingly hampered and limited by uh, decisions from the federal court in terms of uh, the information it collects, uh, how it uses that information, how it stores that information, for how long it is able to store that information. Um, And of course, CSIS is constrained by the CSIS Act um, that uh, under Section 16, for instance, limits some of CSIS's capacities, although perhaps uh, not sort of as much as um, as 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 some might be thinking to believe, but it does impose. So rather than having a an unfettered foreign uh, collection service on which we then impose limits in terms of what they can do, how they can do it, we basically have a domestic service that we have enabled under very specific circumstances to be able to go abroad and assist in the collection of certain types of intelligence. And even that capacity, as I say, as a result of court decisions, has been curtailed. And the final aspect is, of course, in an increasingly challenging world, our allies' resources are limited as well. And ultimately, the value that you have as an ally the reputation, the credibility that you bring depends on what you bring to that table. 
And so we recently had a uh, statement by uh, the current minister of public safety, the extent to which even he was surprised uh, by the extent to which Canada is an intelligence consumer rather than an intelligence provider to our allies. And so there seems to be sort of a disequilibrium uh, in terms of the increasing extent to which we rely on allies relative to what we can offer to them. And that then diminishes the weight that we can bring to the table in terms of decision-making, because if you're going to contribute less, you're going to have less to say, and your voice is going to be less important in terms of shaping and asserting your interests within international fora, in particular the Five Eyes. Very good point. Arguments are made against having a foreign intelligence service. It's too expensive. It's going to become a rogue elephant. Could you talk to some of these arguments, which in, in a number of cases are bogus arguments? Look, I mean, we can ultimately, these are political decisions, right? We live in a democracy and ultimately the people have the right to decide and the people have the right to be wrong. Um, uh, on this particular file, uh, I think the people have been wrong for quite some time. And uh, given that there's very little electoral payoff, if any, on security, intelligence, defense issues in democracies in general, in particular in this country, uh, it is just not a topic that's of keen interest to politicians. Uh, we also, I think, for a long time had a relatively uninformed conversation around these issues in political circles, in part because we have relatively few people in parliament who themselves have served in the security intelligence community or in defense. Um, I think that has improved somewhat, both because of more difficult international circumstances. We have more people with backgrounds in some capacity or another who are serving uh, now in uh, in Parliament. And we also, of course, have the National Inter Intelligence Security Committee of Parliamentarians with a number of people who are now cleared. All this helps sort of raise awareness, helps the, uh, um, helps the extent of informed debate uh, when it comes to the arguments for or against whether this is an investment that ultimately is uh, that ultimately is necessary. Of course, many countries smaller than Canada have made that investment. Um, in uh, you've, you've previously talked, for instance, about Australia, a relatively small and modest organization, but that has is is quite effective uh, and on which Canada has also relied in the past, in particular when it comes to uh, to the uh, to the Indo Pacific. And so it shows that, you know, the Australians have the disadvantage that they didn't win the geographic lottery the way Canada did. That Canadians will say, look, you know, these are other people's problems. These are a far ways off. Um, and um, uh, so we'll let other people worry about these things and make these types of investments. Clearly, Australia has long felt that this is an indispensable investment. It also creates some of the challenges around so what would we have, what would we task that service with? Would we task it with challenges in in Europe or in the Middle East and Africa that might pose risks to some of our key allies in the Indo-Pacific? Um, so where, you know, think of migratory issues and migrant smuggling from Central and South America. Um, so there's, uh, I think we would immediately run into a challenge of what priorities would be set for that particular uh, that particular entity. How do you define the types of national security issues we would want that entity to go after? I mean, the 1984 definition in the CSIS Act uh, is, uh, um, shall we say, rather limited, but it is the uh, definition that that we work with. So one of the opportunities would be in having a a, a new entity is to. Uh, to actually de redefine what we understand by national security and what we want the posture and orientation uh, of such a service to uh, to be. But we also, I think, need to give um, some voice to the critics because a foreign intelligence collection service of whatever kind it looks like, um, so for one thing, it won't fix all of our problems. It's not a panacea. If we look at, for instance, what Australia and the United Kingdom have done that have significantly overhauled their intelligence assessment capability. Um, we recently saw this in our own country where uh, we ran into information gaps and information flow issues within 
uh, within the Privy Council office and at the National Security Intelligence Advisor and the Prime Minister's office. So this likely these issues um, would likely not transpire in the same fashion in Australia or the United Kingdom because they've already recognized that they've had these challenges and reformed uh, the way assessment is structured. We probably need a robust assessment capacity in this country, which this country currently lacks. So if we're having a new foreign intelligence collection agency, but we don't have the integration and assessment capacity issues uh, capability, then the payoff uh, will, will not live up to its potential. And look, I mean, currently we have four assessment capabilities, a small one in the security intelligence section within the Privy Council office, um, a small one within the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, a small one within Global Affairs Canada, uh, and a capacity within the Canadian Armed Forces. And likely the only entity that would be able to bring to bear a sufficiently robust capacity um, that would be able to build it up uh, in the near term would be the Canadian Armed Forces. So then the question is, would you want to have that in a Department of National Defense? And of course, this is a department significantly short on staff and on people. So where are you going to find these people? And then, of course, you're going to need to staff up such an organization. Um, intelligence officers, officers aren't people who can just, you know, these are not off the shelf things that where you just pick up people on the street and uh, and 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 you can deploy them. Um, these are elements that you need to carefully and gradually uh, build, uh, build out, both in terms of value for money and, of course, in terms of ensuring that in a democracy, uh, we always engage uh, in the ways, means and ends uh, in a way that conforms to the expectations of the government of the day. But the long and short of it is that by not having a foreign intelligence collection service that is a dedicated uh, standalone service, um, the government of Canada is depriving itself of a key instrument on information flows and information and domain awareness, because the 21st century is ultimately about information. Who has more, better, more timely information? You might say the information domain is the key domain of statecraft in the 21st century. And so without that particular capability, um, Canada is flying with at least one one eye blind. You've raised a, a bunch of very good points here, not least the point that a service, a Canadian foreign intelligence service that's focused on collection from human sources, would, I think, of necessity be a fairly small service, along the same size as the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. And therefore, it would have to set priorities or have... More accurately, it would have to have priorities set for it on collection. You made a point that I think was a very good one. Canadians have a right to be wrong. Do you think Canadians have a warped understanding of what a foreign intelligence service does and does not do? Would this be a problem for any government considering uh, establishing such a service? That's probably true for all democracies, although I think in Canada it is disproportionate. By and large, people learn about um, the business of covert operations uh, from shows and uh, and from movies and from their favorite streaming service. Um, for a while, um, with a colleague and friend of mine who's an ex-Mountie, um, uh, 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 when we would travel, we would play a little game where we would turn on the show and we would count the number of uh, legal constitutional violations uh, that you would see in that show. And usually within about five minutes, we could get to about 30. Uh, so it is a nice way to illustrate the point that what we see on television, what we see in the movies, what we see in our streaming services really is fiction. Um, it is not the way the business operates. This was also the motivation for uh, for for writing the book that you had mentioned earlier on intelligence as democratic statecraft. Uh, that ultimately there are key measures of accountability and transparency. Um, and I think much of the public has this impression that intelligence services are just these rogue agencies that can just go out and do whatever whatever the heck they want. And of course, the problem is that this is exactly what they do, what our adversaries do. Uh, we've had our own challenges with intelligence services in this country, including by countries that might we might consider partners 
engaging in activities that we would see unacceptable for any democracy to engage in. So there's questions of control there. And of course, we have adversarial countries whose uh, uh, services are um, in, engaged in activities that we would consider completely unacceptable if they were carried out either in terms of ends or in terms of ways uh, by uh, an entity in this country. And so, you know, we can't fault the Canadian public when you come with that sort of an understanding for saying, whoa, hang on, that's not the sort of people we want to have, uh, we want to have uh, with representing Canadian interests and a Canadian flag. So there's a lot of, I think, uh, public education that needs to be done generally around intelligence, which is partially why you know, I think the your podcast series is uh, is a, is such a terrific opportunity because it gives people an opportunity to uh, to gain sort of some different insights into uh, into a business that uh, that by and large people understand have a rather should we put it charitably inchoate understanding uh, understanding of um, so uh, and and but I think a lot of this also hinges on. Look, it's a community that can't speak for itself. It's generally a challenge that we have, for instance, with people in uniform. If you think about police, you think about the military, you think about um, intelligence uh, services. These are not communities that usually are at liberty to explain to the public what they do, how they do it, why they do it. Some of it might come out if you see prosecutions by the RCMP in court. Um, and some of the more um, interesting pieces often um, don't end up making into disclosure proceedings. Um, so there's relatively little sort of information on it. Politicians, by and large, like to keep it out of the public eye, both, I think, out of political interests and uh, because it's not really what they want to be known for, um, as uh, most most governments simply don't have security intelligence or defense as priority issues for their particular cabinets, since that's not what they get elected on. Um, and so there's really no one out there who's trying to do some of the explaining. But we have seen a really interesting shift. So we now see uh, the directors in both the Australia and the United Kingdom, not just releasing annual reports, but actually giving fairly lengthy both statements and then Q and a yes. on the release of their annual reports. Yeah. We've seen, I think also uh, CSIS being more active um, and more explicit with their reports. So there's an understanding that there are instruments available to the community to explain better what it is they do, why they do it and what the challenges are that both they, the country and the citizenry is facing. Right. That leads to the, my next question. Are Canadians willing to accept that a Canadian Foreign Intelligence Service would, of necessity, break the law in foreign countries, and that its officers would employ tactics like psychological manipulation, deceit, bribery, and perhaps even blackmail to recruit foreigners to spy for Canada? Are Canadians up to that? So, look, I think this is always a balance, and it's an interesting, uh, it, it's it's a balance that you also get in my book, that sort of we, uh, governments are much quicker to expand uh, the capabilities and capacities for intelligence collection, both domestically and internationally, and activities than they are the capacities for effective transparency, accountability, and control associated with these entities. So I think it's less about the um, the means, the mechanisms, the methods that are used, and more about making sure government provides appropriate priorities, appropriate direction, an appropriate legal framework, and a way of validating uh, that uh, and such an agency engages uh, as it is directed and as it is enabled by legislation and by the constitution. And there are countries that have gone even further. So the German Constitutional Court, for instance, has effectively decided that the Bundesnachrichtendienst, so the German foreign um, uh, foreign signals and foreign human collection agency, which are in one agency in Germany, yeah. um, would uh, would essentially need to abide by German constitutional provisions, even when it starts when it spies on foreigners. 
um, and that that would apply in both the human and the signals domain. Now, there's sort of some exceptions or so around this, uh, but uh, you know, the 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 audience to the podcast should probably understand that one of the differences in foreign collection versus domestic, so foreign um, secret intelligence versus domestic security intelligence is that domestic security intelligence uh, is subject to a host of uh, legal constraints, yes. um, legal thresholds under which um, a security intelligence service needs to go to uh, the courts to get a judicial warrant needs to go to the minister to get a ministerial warrant needs to go go and go by the intelligence commissioner has a host of internal uh, bureaucratic approval process before it can engage in activities but that ultimately these are agencies that get paid to effectively break the law but when they do it domestically they have to get legal authorizations to do that. The courts will watch them very carefully. They have to report to the courts to make sure that they actually did it exactly in the way that the judge expected them to. Um, so it's not just about getting a warrant. It's often about reporting back. So the question then is, what mechanisms might the legislator decide to put in place to ensure that a foreign collection agency um, also has the appropriate constraints and controls um, on it. Um, and when you talk about the methods, the means, the ends, that of course raises interesting questions about, well, so um, what the resourcing might look like, because depending on the methods that you use, you're going to get, they're going to come with very different types of costs, for instance. And so other countries, for instance, have chosen to have parliamentary committees or a parliamentary committee that simply looks at the budgets and that has uh, classified access um, as, an, as a way to assessing whether the sort of budget requests that come from these agencies are reasonable and how they should be uh, how they should be appropriately resourced. So perhaps if we had another entity in Canada, it might also make some of the funding constraints that currently the agencies are facing with uh, like many security intelligence defense agencies, not just in Canada, but abroad, rapidly growing demand for the services they offer, uh, but at best relatively stagnant budgets um, to cope with these demands. So maybe it would also allow us to have a bit more of a uh, of an informed debate within parliament about, uh, about resourcing. You raise a very good point, I think, uh, when you talked about the controls that are applied to the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. It's a point that I raised in the previous podcast CSIS is essentially a law-abiding service, but a foreign intelligence service, almost by definition, has to be a law-breaking service. That leads to my final question, and that is whether, assuming the government decided to create such a service, should it be part of CSIS or should it be a separate agency? Yeah, it's an interesting point about sort of the, the law-breaking service that, of course, um... I mean, as I said, I mean, what what do police do when they do criminal investigations and they get warrants? They break the law, but we do it within a, an appropriate legal framework. We do it with an appropriate constitutional framework. We're then able to challenge some of this in court, and so all this becomes a bit more nebulous when you talk about a dedicated standalone uh, standalone human collection service, for instance. And so that brings us then to your point about. Would it be housed within CSIS? Would it be housed in a separate agency? Of course, as you've already brought up, um, CSIS does have foreign collection uh, capacities. Um, it, it has three disclosed foreign stations in Washington and London and in Paris. Um, but we can assume that, for instance, with some of the Canadian priorities, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's public disclosure on, for instance, CSIS-related support activities when it came to the Afghanistan mission, um, that uh, it, it is it is an, it, CSIS is already engaged um, in, uh, in some capacity uh, around the world, and that the advantage that CSIS has, if you turn around my early argument about uh, the G7 countries, is by having it in one entity, it's a very efficient mechanism. So if you look at the United States, for instance, uh, the and, and, and Samuel Huntington's uh, infamous 1980s book, The Promise of Disharmony, uh, 
the U.S. system is a very competitive system where, yes, you have by far the largest intelligence community in the world, better yeah. resourced and larger than all of the allied countries combined. But you also have a lot of coordination issues within the agencies, um, between agencies. There's a lot of competition for budgets and for other types of resources, uh, for attention. Uh, we have the congressional oversight system that is very different from what we do in Canada and elsewhere. And so... Um, one of the arguments you can make for the Canadian setup that we currently have is that it's very efficient. Um, and it's a very ready mechanism in order to coordinate with other entities. But as I point out, I think the constraints that are interesting being uh, uh, imposed on CSIS by the courts, um, and of course, you know, we, we've seen other entities like the communication security establishment that have had significant legislative changes precisely because the frameworks we had were simply no longer fit for purpose. You might argue that we're running into a situation where, um, given that the government has currently has a very homeopathic, uh, careful effort underway to open the CSIS Act for possible reform, I think nowhere near as ambitious as it needs to be. It suggests that even CSIS's own posture is probably no longer fit for the 21st century. So are we then going to try to reform its domestic tasks and its international tasks all right. at the same time? Or is this simply becoming too complex an effort? There are too many collective action problems and we ultimately want to disentangle that. Now, from a public administration perspective, the argument is always made that, look, rather than creating a new bureaucracy, work with the entities you have because it's very cumbersome to stand up new entities. I mean, look at CSIS. CSIS is only now shedding um, some of the colors of the RCMP culture, given that, yes, it was created out of the RCMP, but many of the people who initially came to work for it were former um, uh, yeah. were, were former, were former Mounties. Um, you can see sort of CSIS, a CSE coming into its own outside of sort of a, a D and D framework in terms of, uh, of, of signals, intelligence, um, collection in terms of its own institutional culture. Uh, look for instance at the RCMP, it recently stood up NC3, the national cybercrime coordination, uh, center that had a fairly long runway just on the planning side, then a five year plan to get it to the point where it is today. Uh, it's a very, I would say efficient and effective organization for what it does but it took it quite a long time to get here. So all that to say is um, if or when a government does make that decision, it is not a foregone conclusion that we just kind of create legislation and throw some money at it. And tomorrow you're going to have your foreign collection service. There'll need to be a very careful plan. And I would say by the plan, and then you can stand it up to uh, being fully up and running. You're probably looking at the better part of a decade. But of course the problem is the world isn't going to get any easier if you look at the next 10 or 20 years. Life is only going to get more challenging. Yes. Whether you think about anthropogenic threats, naturogenic threats. And so if in, it's in 10 years to decide, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have, and we actually need it because of the existential challenges that Canada and allies are facing, it's kind of too late at that point. And we've realized yeah. that recently with some of the conflicts in the world that we simply weren't prepared. And so this is about ultimately not for the challenges we face today, but it's for the challenges that we face tomorrow to position ourselves, posture ourselves robustly. To pick up on your point, I've seen it written, a uh, foreign intelligence service started from scratch would take a generation to find its feet and to operate efficiently. Clearly, it would get some work done in the run-up to that, but it's going to take time. Your point is extremely well taken. Professor, I want to thank you. This has all been most enlightening. May I once again mention your insightful book that you co-authored entitled Intelligence is the Democratic Statecraft, which I commend to our listeners. In any debate about a foreign intelligence service, this book would have to be consulted. Our best wishes to you, Professor. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to our technical support officer, Gio Petty, for the application of his skills in staging these podcasts. In our next podcast, I will engage a debate about a foreign intelligence service with Mr. Vincent Rigby, 
who was the National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister recently. 